Okay, so uh, one, one last one. If you want to download the tutorial materials, you can go to this tinyurl.com slash schemage Eurosci-Pi, or you can also follow the link on the Eurosci-Pi program webpage. And uh, if you don't have internet access, there are two USB sticks. Thank you. I have one of them. So to, to be sure that everybody has the time to uh, download the materials, to open the folder, start the index notebook, which is here, um, we will start with a gentle introduction to scikit image. So uh, without any notebooks, it will be just some slides so that everybody has the time to get the setup uh, running. And then we have four four different notebooks that we will see together um, and uh, with a mixture of uh, code and exercises. And there are also uh, two bonus notebooks if you're going really fast and you already know everything about uh, image processing. Uh, one thing is that <laughs> I just pushed these uh, two notebooks by just, I mean, one minute ago. So if you downloaded the materials before and you want to do the bonus notebooks, you need to uh, download them again. Uh, a, a few words about myself. So I'm uh, Emmanuel. Uh, I'm a researcher in material science uh, in Paris. And um, I study glass, for example. I do a lot of uh, 3D imaging, tomography. Uh, I, I've been a Scikit Image core contributor for a couple of years now, f five years, I think. And um, so here you can find my, my contacts. And um, as a small anecdote, I also do uh, scientific Python as a family because uh, you may have seen that we brought our Scikit baby uh, who was crawling around the day before. And uh, my partner, Gail, is a uh, uh, working with uh, scikit-learn. So I do scikit-image, he does scikit-learn, and uh, we have the scikit-baby. <laughs> so, uh, guten Morgen, everybody. Um, I see that some people are still getting uh, installed. So le let's start with a small introduction to scikit-image. With that, it's here. So you, you can access the slides by just clicking on this link, eurosci.pdf. And so I will be presenting today the Scikit Image um, toolkit, which is for image processing. So uh, a small survey. Uh, who, who does image processing here in the audience? A um, couple of people, yeah. And um, for which applications do you use image processing? So, so, sorry? Or um, ORC? Yeah, like uh, text recognition or feature e extraction from for machine learning, okay? And for, for for which kind of end application? Okay, very interesting. Industrial quality check. Uh, spectral imaging for which kind of domain? Uh, all kinds, okay, cool. Shock physics, okay, so you have an experiment in uh, physics and your data are images and you need to get some science out of that. Cool, someone else? Satellite imaging, great. So uh, as you see, there are a lot of different applications uh, of uh, image processing. So uh, you've named a few very interesting ones and I've put uh, some other here including medical imaging. So you mentioned satellite imaging. Uh, can you recognize automatically, for example, that there is a draft uh, somewhere uh, in agriculture, cell biology, uh, automatic driving, where you need to be really fast to recognize that uh, a car is coming uh, ahead of you, or uh, text recognition for, for this uh, very nice uh, Google Translate application, for example. So there are a, a lot of different fields where you want to do image processing. And by image processing, I mean a um, very loose definition of uh, taking images as data and doing some action based on this uh, image. It can be producing a new image, extracting 
uh, scientific data or uh, taking a decision like uh, breaking your car very fast. Um, hi to everybody who is just coming. So if you want to download the materials, the URL is here. And I'm just taking five minutes to introduce Psychit Image with slides so that everybody has the time to download the notebook. So there are also two USB keys uh, which are passing around. So wh what is Psychit Image? Psychit Image is uh, the, the image processing library that uh, is integrated with the scientific Python ecosystem. So with Python, but with NumPy data array. And there are other image processing libraries using Python, like uh, you may have heard of uh, OpenCV, for example, which is a really good and powerful library. Um, Scikit Image is maybe the more NumPy-ish uh, library. That is, it, uh, you will see during the tutorial that it works really well with NumPy arrays. It has a very simple API, so it's really good to get started with uh, image processing. And also, it works for 2D and 3D images. So in the tutorial, we will see only 2D images because it's easier to visualize. But if you're doing uh, tomography or confocal microscopy, MRI, or if some colleagues in the lab are using this kind of imaging modality, you can also use Scikit Image for this. Um, so you all know the NumPy uh, data container array, which is a very uh, powerful object to manipulate digital data with possibilities such as indexing, slicing, fancy indexing. And um, since we all love the NumPy array, we uh, would like to have an image processing package where uh, we can also use NumPy arrays. And what is really nice is that uh, there is a direct correspondence between arrays and images. Because, for example, if, if you take this small code, where I defined uh, an array of uh, shape five by five, and uh, it has some black and white pixel, so the array can directly be visualized as an image. So a, a 2D uh, image is just a grayscale. So sorry, a 2D array is just a grayscale array. And if I want to get uh, a 3D, uh, an RGB, a color image, then this image has, in fact, uh, a third dimension corresponding to the RGB channels. So this is how we will manipulate uh, RGB images. And so a 3D image, like a 3D cube that you can ha find in tomography, for example, it's just a 3D NumPy array. Uh, the, the API of uh, Scikit Image is quite simple. It relies mostly on functions. So you have some modules where you can find functions like this Gaussian filter function and function operate on NumPy arrays. And most of them has, have as, as an output uh, the also NumPy arrays. So this is uh, uh, drawn here. You have the module Scikit Image, which you import as Image, some module filters, restoration. So it's not a f completely flat namespace. You always have to find functions inside some modules. So you will see a lot of uh, from image, import filters, and so on. And I will use mostly the submodule names. And uh, you have functions inside the submodules which operate on NumPy arrays and which uh, have an output which is also an NumPy array. Or it can be also a value like uh, a threshold or something like that. So. Um, Scikit Image interacts well with the rest of the scientific Python ecosystem. You might have seen uh, some other tutorials uh, here at EuroSciPy. Uh, yesterday, well, it was in the intro track. Uh, there was a very nice tutorial on, on NumPy. Sorry about that. And so you can open a file f uh, from, a, from the disk as a NumPy array, then apply some filters, get some new NumPy arrays. Uh, and since you manipulate NumPy arrays, you can also use other uh, Python modules like scikit-learn for machine learning on the same data objects, which can be really convenient. And you can also do some visualization uh, using the usual scientific Python modules like matplotlib, Mayavi, and, and so on. 
Um, so here I'm, I'm just flashing a couple of slides of what you can do with scikit image. Uh, you can do image filtering, that is transforming an image into another image using some neighborhood information about the pixels. Uh, for example, blurring filters or edge filters. Uh, you can do segmentation, that is labeling pixels corresponding to different objects. Um, measures, an image of the label where you want to know the size, uh, the perimeter and so on of uh, uh, objects. So this tutorial will will not be a catalog of uh, all the different submodules and what you can do in each submodule. It would be very boring. Uh, instead, I will try to show you uh, some classical op image processing operations that you can do with a scikit image, and it will most of the time use uh, several submodules at the same time. Because uh, in image processing, one thing that is very important is uh, to have some ideas about a processing strategy or workflows, because you will need to combine different operations together. And that's what I will try to, to show you in this tutorial. Um, so let me just show you the scikit image website because it might be useful if you're looking for documentation. So it's on scikitimage.org. Oops, sorry. And so it, it has a, a documentation uh, web page, but what's very useful is a gallery, gallery of examples. And I really encourage you to go often to the gallery if you're doing image processing, because th this gallery uh, consists in little pictures where, um, with a title. So if, for example, you want to, I don't know, to, to label uh, an image, to label objects, you can just do label. And okay, there is this label image regions. I want to know how to do that. And here I have some code. Uh, a few explanations and the resulting image. So it's a quite convenient uh, way to learn image processing by the example. Um, so wh who in the audience is already using scikit image? Uh, like 10 people maybe? And uh, are you using the gallery or from time to time? Uh huh. Yeah, not not so much. So uh, it it might be a good idea to use the gallery more because you can learn a lot of things. Okay. So uh, so much for the introduction. Uh, so who could not in, uh, download or copy the tutorial materials? Okay. Is it better like this? No. And like this? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, about tutorial materials, who uh, doesn't have the folder uh, copied on uh, his or her disk? Everybody has it? Okay. That's really nice. So we will start with the first notebook, which is uh, images as digital arrays, where we will see that uh, in scikit image, images are just standard NumPy arrays, uh, as I uh, said uh, for in the slides, and that you can manipulate uh, image arrays as you would do with uh, any other arrays. So let's get started. So here I just import matplotlib, NumPy, and let's um, create our first num image using the data submodule of scikit image. So uh, I import this submodule. Yes? What's the name of what? Oh, sorry. It's. Uh, so I index is uh, this table of contents here. And then it's arrays. So here we, we are on the arrays.ipython uh, notebook. 
Okay. So we create an image array using one of the functions of the data uh, submodule. And if we ask for its type, it is an NumPy data array. And since uh, we can also check that it's a 2D array. And since it's a 2D array, we can plot it using matplotlib. OK, so basically any 2D array can be plotted using the imshow command, imshow for image show of matplotlib. Um, and so here in this cell, um, I wrote the correspondence between pixel values. So here I accessed the top left corner of the coins image using standard indexing of NumPy arrays. Um, and so I, I get uh, an integer value of 47. And then the data type, so it's uh, unsigned integers uh, on 8 bytes. And the interval of pixel values, so I can use standard uh, statistics on the NumPy arrays using coins dot min, coins dot max, and the image dimensions, it's just the shape of the array. Okay, so it's, it's very transparent, so you don't even need an abstraction on top of the NumPy array to uh, manipulate images, which um, makes inter interoperability really uh, better, because if you would have a separate image object, then uh, you would lose the generality of the NumPy arrays. Uh, so here we created a grayscale image, and now we will have an RGB image, which is a cat image. So I, I try to put a lot of uh, coffee in cat images so that it's easier for you early in the morning to, to follow this tutorial. So here is a, the, the first uh, cat image. Um, and when you ask for its shape, uh, you see that so this first number corresponds to the number of rows and then the number of columns as in a standard NumPy array and uh, then the last um, shape dimension is the number of channels R, G and B. Um, so one thing that is very important is that if you have any question even if you think that this question is really dumb, it, it probably is not dumb at all, so please ask it, because uh, some people are probably listening to this tutorial and streaming or later on YouTube, but the difference with you is that they cannot ask questions. So <laughs> please take advantage of being here in this room, and I'm sure that your questions will be really useful for other people. Uh, so please, please, please ask questions. <laughs> so. Since we have an empire array, we can start uh, modifying uh, the image. For example, uh, let's say that I want to make uh, a red square somewhere in the image. So a red square means that I want to modify the first channel uh, of the image. And that's what I do here. So I, I modify all the channels so that the first one is 255, so fully red, and then the other channels are uh, to zero, so no green and no uh, blue. And OK, so it works. I can have a red square on my image. So you see, I didn't use any psychic image function here. It's just standard NumPy machinery. Um, so a quick reminder of shapes. 2D grayscale, it's row column coordinates, 2D multi-channel, row column channel, and you have the same for uh, 3D images. So le let's start with a very simple exercise. Uh, well, let's start with this exercise. It might or might not be easy, uh, but it will make you use NumPy. So what I want you is to take the cat picture and to modify it with a frame, a black frame around it, uh, a 20 pixel black frame. You can keep the same shape, just put the border, the 20 pixel white border, and make it black. So let's take three minutes for this. 
And uh, by the way, uh, I will show the solution to most exercises, but uh, if you want to, to be sure at home that you have the solution, there is a solution notebook for most notebooks, M maybe not for the OAS because there is just one uh, exercise, but after, for example, Neighbors has it Neighbors dash solution notebook. So there are notebooks of solutions. And if you're having trouble with anything, please raise your hand. color map with this <laughs> and let's just save okay oh, and it just stayed the same uh, yeah okay don't it's because it's an rgb it's, it's a good point i will I will answer one question for everybody because uh, here you might see that I had used the color map for the coin's image, color, color map equal gray. It was because um, there is no color information for a grayscale image. So Matplotlib has to know how to visualize it. Should, should it use a um, black to white color map or uh, dark blue to yellow color map, like false colors. But for, for the RGB image, since there is a color channel, you don't need to specify a color map. It will just use the RGB triplet for every pixel. So if you add a color map, it won't do anything or it will throw an error, I don't know. Yeah, because the color information is already in the image. Does that make sense? But thanks for the question. So who, who has uh, already done the exercise? Fraction of people. So I will start correcting it. So we, we have our cat away, and we want to draw this black frame. So we, we cannot do one line of code to do this, so we will first uh, color in black the, the first 20 lines, the last 20 lines, and then we will do the same for the columns. So the first 20 lines, it can be done like this. Then the last 20 lines. The first 20 columns. And the last 20 columns. And let's check this. Okay. Um, so you, you see that here, al although the, the value for the pixels zero, it should be a triplet zero, zero, zero for each channel. I, I'm using here what's called NumPy broadcasting, which, so I, I, could, I could do it like this. But if I just write zero, then NumPy automatically completes for all the channels. So it's it's uh, 
Uh, another illustration of uh, the power of NumPy, you don't need to write a lot of code. Uh, it can be quite implicit. And then it does what you want. OK. Uh, did it make sense? Or is it puzzling someone here? No? OK. Um, one, one thing that is also very nice with NumPy is that you can use Boolean masks. So who, who doesn't know about Boolean masks? You're perfectly right not to know. Uh, <laughs> there's no problem if you don't know it. But uh, a mask is a NumPy array uh, on which you apply a Boolean condition. For example, here, I, when I write coins uh, smaller than 90, so it's a Boolean condition which will be applied to every pixel and it will return an array of the same shape as coins, but where each pixel will be true or false, depending whether the condition is true or false. Um, so, for example, yeah, let me let me just create. Okay, so here this uh, mask background. I just represented here, so it's a, uh, a Boolean array, and I can use this Boolean array to perform operations on another image of the same shape, like my original image. For example, if I want to put to zero all the pixels of the coin image where the value was uh, smaller than 90, I can do this using this uh, very compact syntax. Um, coins bg of mask bg equals zero. So what it means is that it will put to zero all the pixels of coins bg for which the mask was true. Okay. Uh, are you familiar with uh, this kind of... Uh, yeah? Okay. So this can be really useful for images because you can just take a subset of the pixels thanks to the mask and then uh, do some operations like uh, modifying the pixels. Um, so I, I will not do this exercise here because uh, it's just very standard NumPy machinery, but uh, if you're interested, you can do it uh, at home or if you're bored during the tutorial, which is just writing uh, a function to convert a color image to grayscale by applying weights to the three different uh, color channels. And this, this weight that you see here, they correspond to the sensitivity of your eye because we're much more sensitive to the green channel. And, but, so this is an exercise, but in fact, there is a function of Psychic Image in the color submodule, which does exactly this for you, converting a color image to uh, gray. It's called RGB to gray. Okay, um, a few words about data types of pixel values. Uh, you might have seen that the coin's image had integer uh, values for its pixels. Um, and you have two different conventions for data types and values of uh, pixel intensities. Uh, the first one corresponds to the usual JPEG PNG images that you have uh, where one pixel is encoded between zero and two uh, 155, that is uh, 2 to the power 8 minus 1. So it's an image encoded on 8 bits. And uh, so these are integers, uh, which is nice because you have a, a limited number of values, so you save a lot of, uh, of space on disk, for example. But uh, the precision is quite limited. And you might also want to do operations on floats, for example, when you want to uh, do convolutions or apply some weights on pixels, then it's more natural to do this with floating point numbers. Um, however, for floating point numbers, uh, what, what should be the interval of pixel values? Uh, the scikit image convention corresponds to what is found in the mathematical literature, which is that pixels should be between 0 and 1. So not between 0 and 255 float. So uh, it means that you can have some conversions from uh, integers to floats that change the range of uh, pixel values. So this might be a bit confusing. Uh, 
when you start using scikit image. So that's why I really wanted to insist on that. And so I have uh, some example about data types here. Uh, the first cell here is to show you that uh, integer da data type can be a bit dangerous if you don't pay attention. For example, here I have this camera image, so uh, once again that I found in the data submodule of scikit image. And let's say it's an empire way, so I can do whatever I want, and in particular I can multiply it by two. Why not? However, um, it's uh, an integer only on 8-bit, so it, it's very easy to have overflow. And when I uh, show display the image here, you can see that uh, some some pixels that should be quite dark are now quite um, uh, bright, and the sky that was bright is now dark. It's because we have looped uh, on 8 bits. It's modulo 255, and uh, so we don't have the right pixel values. So careful with overflow. If you want to do operations, usually it's better to switch to uh, float. And for this, you can use the image as float function of scikit-image. Um, so when I convert my camera image to float, you see that the max that was 255 in uint8 is now 1, the floating point numbers. And um, if I apply a Gaussian filter, which uses some float, uh, floating point weights to the camera image, which was uh, integer type, you, you see that first the, uh, the output, so camera Gaussian has a floating point number data type, and also that its, uh, its max is very different from the max of the original image, because now uh, it has values between 0 and 1. So please be careful about uh, intensity values, and if you're not sure, I would advise to switch to floating point numbers as soon as possible. Okay, um, so with images, of course, you don't want to use only uh, the images of the scikit image uh, data module, yes? Yes. Uh, okay, so the, the question was, uh, let's say I have a floating point number image from 0 to 1, and you multiply it by 2. Um, so this, this will not be a problem because uh, uh, you, you don't have an overflow. Uh, however, the, some scikit-image algorithms have parameters that are tuned for 0 to 1 intervals, like default parameters of some filters, they assume that uh, the, the max is 1 and not 2. So you, you might have behaviors that are suboptimal. So you will have less problems uh, with floating point numbers, but it's, it's still better to try to, to stick to the 0, 1 uh, range. And uh, I think that you have a function to, to rescale uh, let me check this in the color submodule. Color dot. Uh, color dot. <coughs> Is it like rescale? Or maybe util? Transform? Oh, thank you. In which uh, submodule? Well, wh when I don't know, what I do is I go to the scikit image documentation and then to the API reference and then we scale, we scale intensity. Okay, it's in the exposure submodule. Okay. But y you see, there are a lot of functions in scikit image, so it's completely okay not to know all functions. But you might guess that if you have an operation that uh, you may want to apply several times, it's already coded in scikit image. So 
go to the API web page, just uh, type some keywords, see which functions are available. And if you can use a function that's already coded, you'll have less bugs in your code. Uh, it will be easier to maintain. So it's always better to use a function that is already coded instead of uh, writing your own functions. Uh, also, using the gallery of examples might be useful. Uh, n n n not, a, not as a first step, but for example, here when I used uh, this uh, Gaussian filter on the camera, you see that I got uh, floating point numbers, but I can. Uh, camera Gaussian uint equal. Uh, Images as you write. You see, I, I convert back to. If you want to minimize the the memory usage. Yeah. No, no. Well, y it wouldn't make sense, I think, because um, when you're using a Gaussian filter, the kernel. Uh, the Gaussian kernel is a floating point away. It has uh, weights yeah, which are. Let's, let's say you have a uniform window. Okay, so uh, if it were like a, a uniform window, uh, I th there is a uniform filter, and if you input uh, an integer data type, it will output an integer data type. So w when it makes sense to stick with integers, we always stick with integers. Okay. Yeah. But Th thanks for the question. Yeah, m memory usage, uh, it's, uh, it's quite well done in scikit-image, I would say. Uh, it's, there is always room for improvement. And uh, if you have uh, some ideas about how to save memories, uh, you're very welcome to open uh, issues and, and, and so on on GitHub. But for example, since I'm a uh, tomography user, I have really huge images, like one gigabyte image for one image, so I'm very concerned about saving memory as much as possible. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so wh what can we do if uh, we want to use other images than the ones from uh, scikit-image.data? Uh, we can use the IO, IO for input-output submodules for opening and saving. Uh, from and to image files that are on disk. So, so here I import IO and I have this file name for the camera image, which is in the data D of scikit image. S and so this time I use this IO.imread for image read uh, function. And if I want to save it, so he here I'm just creating a temporary uh, folder, so don't worry about that. And uh, I can save it to disk. And I see you using the OS module that uh, I do have a PNG file, uh, which has the, the image of the camera. So um, imsave guesses the format of the image according to the extension. So you can use JPEG, TIFF, PNG, and so on. And uh, it's, it's possible also to save a floating point number image to a, a file, but since it will, for, for PNG, it will save the image as uh, values between 0 and 255, so uh, on one byte, then it wants, it raises a warning saying that there is a possible precision loss because we lost some information from floating point numbers to uh, the image PNG format. So I if you want to keep floating point numbers, you can also use uh, NumPy uh, data formats like .npy, uh, or you can also uh, save raw data as floating point numbers. So you have several possibilities, but usually you'll be happy with saving as a JPEG, PNG, and so on. Uh, so this was the end of this first notebook. So just getting familiar with images as NumPy ways. Uh, is there any question before we do uh, any real scikit-image stuff?
Yes. Um, it, it has uh, maybe some different keywords arguments like uh, so I, I don't know well the matplotlib imwid so uh, I, I'm not sure about the difference but for example you can uh, so th the question for <laughs> the audio recording was uh, what is the advantage of the scikit image imwid so this function to open uh, images as numpy arrays compared to the one that you have in matplotlib as well and so you have a keyword argument to open a color image as a gray uh, array, uh, gray level uh, image also. You, you have some keyword arguments like this, but the difference is very small because uh, both functions are using um, a third party library as a backend, like peel, for example. So uh, the, the, the core stuff uh, is very comparable. There, there might even be calls to the matplotlib uh, function. I, I'm pretty sure it does, yeah. So thanks for the question, Phil. And now we will switch to our second uh, notebook, which is about image visualization. So you can either click on visualization, or uh, if you go to the folder, it's visualization.ipnb visualization and image processing. So when we're doing image processing, we're very lucky people because compared to other kind of data like uh, uh, speech processing or uh, marketing data in a one million dimension uh, data space, we can visualize almost everything that we can do. And we should really take advantage of this uh, by visualizing, of course, course the final results that we want to get but also intermediate steps to be sure that when we have different filters the output of uh, one function is really what we want to get and so on so uh, for for this um, we have several visualization uh, possibilities so of course we can visualize images with this im show function of matplotlib but you also have functions to draw uh, contours of uh, values in an image, like this contour in red here, or you can also plot uh, points superimposed on an image, like uh, what was done here uh, in yellow on, on this image, plotting the points of interest with uh, corners. And so in this notebooks, uh, you have a, a few examples about uh, how to use imshow, how to use contours, and uh, how to do a coordinate. And uh, there is an exercise at the end, which is to draw the contours of the darkest regions uh, on, a, on an image. And so I, I will not execute all the cells because it's quite boring, I think, to just uh, see the presenter doing shift enter, shift enter. And there is no image processing concept here in this notebook. It's only uh, visualization. So I, I let you execute the cells and go to the exercise. And um, I, I will uh, say a few words about uh, the, the exercise at the end. So le le let's take a few minutes for this to just execute the cells. I, I will do it, but n not comment it. You, you can just read it. Oh, yes, yeah, no, s s s something that's maybe important is that um, here I have used the matplotlib notebook extension. Uh, before I used matplotlib inline, you might have seen. So the difference is when you do matplotlib inline, when you do imshow, you just get a static PNG image, um, which is perfectly okay. But if you want more interaction with your figure, then uh, you, you can use matplotlib notebook because then you get a uh, matplotlib figure inside the browser. So it, I so, sorry? So we, we can compare the, the, the notebook that I had before, like the, the, this array. So here you see I had done imshow camera. So here what, what I have is just 
uh, a PNG file that is displayed in an HTML page in the browser. And so, for example, I can save the image, I can copy it, and, and so on. A and it's because I had done matplotlib inline here. And here, it's, it's a bit different. So I'm sorry, my, the figure is very, really big because my fonts are huge. But for example, I can just, if I uh, put my mouse on the image, I can see the value of the pixel. I can also like uh, select a region. Um, I can move and so on. So it's more interactive. Um, I, I have to say that uh, I use a notebook for presenting, but not for my own work. And uh, what, what I, I do when, I, when I'm working is that I do IPython just in the terminal. And then, sorry. And here, when, when I have this uh, picture in Matplotlib, I, I do have uh, an interactive figure where I have uh, the value of the pixel, the coordinates, where I can zoom, and so on. It's, it's just in the notebook that it's a bit clumsier when you have to choose the extension. And, um, but since we're using the notebook, uh, I, in this visualization example, in this visualization notebook, I use the notebook uh, extension so that you can have more interactions. But uh, usually I just use the inline mode uh, because I, I don't need interactions. I will just reduce the fonts for <laughs> this notebook. So, so something which is really useful and which people uh, usually don't know is this uh, contour function of matplotlib, which allows you to uh, superimpose contours uh, on an image. And you can actually uh, superimpose the contour of one array uh, on top of uh, another image, another image array, as long as it has compatible shapes. That's uh, wh what is do done in the exercise. It just look for change of uh, intensity, like going from white to black with um, change over a certain threshold? Um, so the, the threshold is uh, usually specified by the user like this. I ask for the 40 uh, contour, and it means that uh, it will look for the line at which uh, uh, on one side you have values smaller than 40 and the, on the other side greater than 40. Does it answer your question? Yeah. It, it, us it uses actually a, an algorithm that's called marching, marching cubes. Some people might have heard about it. So just finding the contours, but y y you might think of a uh, gray value image as an elevation plot, like, you know, maps uh, where you have uh, altitudes. You can either represent them with contours or you can also have 3D maps. 
and uh, these are exactly the same. It's uh, like uh, altitude uh, lines, ISO altitude lines. Okay, so let's do the exercise. So we, we have this uh, cat image and we want to uh, to display the contour of the darkest regions. However, um, it's not always very convenient to uh, speak of, of darker regions in an RGB uh, image because in an RGB image, each channel mixes together inf uh, information about light intensity and color. So therefore we can switch to another color space, which is the, the LAB color space. So L is for light intensity and AB is for color. Color.rgb.lib, I think it works. Yes, and I will just display the cat image and then contour of cat lab. So I will just use the channel, the light intensity, so the first channel of um, the cat. So where did it go? Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, I forgot to make a figure. Okay, so here in black, I have some contours. So I don't like the color, so I will put it yellow. And if I ask for the value 10, then I have smaller regions. And every time I decrease, I have even smaller regions, okay? So in this exercise, we see two things. Uh, contours, obviously, and that you can display contours of the array cat LAB superimposed on another array, so this is not a problem. And also how to switch between color spaces like from the RGB color space to the LAB um, color space. So this is very useful when you want to manipulate color images and you want to decouple light intensity from color uh, uh, information. Okay. So time is uh, running really fast, so uh, I will switch to uh, another notebook now. So I see that uh, some people are looking at the screen. So sh shall I uh, leave this on the screen for a few more seconds? Or yes. <laughs> and if you have questions, please ask them. Yes. Yes. Uh, so the, the, the question is, wh what is this notation, three dots? So it's actually the same as doing uh, colon, colon for all dimensions but the last one. It's just a shortcut, meaning that take everything for all other dimensions. And uh, so it, it's all dimensions and then the other dimensions are specified. So it's all the first dimensions that are, are not specified, but for more clarity, I, I could have uh, written this. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's my uh, usual uh, NumPy uh, reflex, but uh, see, it, it's the same. Thanks for the question. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Th that's a great question and we will see exactly this in the next notebook. 
<laughs> how to do this automatically. Um, with with two two ranges of values, it's uh, very easy with scikit image, uh, and we will see image thresholding in the next notebook. So it's uh, uh, it's called image thresholding. With uh, with uh, three or more, it's also possible, but it's it's a bit more advanced because it uses all other algorithms, which are called clustering. Like you want to cluster together image values, and there is a, a link at the end of the tutorial for this uh, more advanced uh, uh, stuff. So the, the the question was, okay, here we're doing things by hand visualization, but you can also do this with ImageJ or other interactive programs. Can you do this more automatically? And this is what we're going to see in the in the next uh, tutorial, so which is called exposure. So it's this. Uh, no, it's pixel values, sorry, pixel values that uh, IPython notebook. And uh, in, in this IPython notebook, we see how to transform an image using the values of its pixels. Meaning, we, for each pixel, we will take decisions according only to the value of the pixel. We will not consider any neighborhood or anything. And uh, this will be the last notebook, uh, taking into account neighborhood special information. But here we will do simple manipulation on pixel values and contrast. And we will see image thresholding. So what we will see is how to plot the histogram of pixel values for one image, um, how to threshold it automatically <laughs> to get uh, the binary image, so to get uh, an object and its background, or how to change the contrast of an image. So, um, is, is it large enough at the back, or shall I increase it a bit? No, it, it's fine. Okay, cool. So, let me. Oh, oh, I forgot this. Let me use once again this uh, camera image. And here I will use functions from the exposure submodule. So le let's start by looking together at the documentation of the exposure.histogram function. And um, it says that it returns the histogram of an image. So it uses a number of bins for the histogram that uh, is a good value when you have uh, eight byte uh, integers. So we won't have to bother about it here, and it returns the values of the histograms and uh, the centers of the bin. Okay, so we can ask for the histogram of this camera image, and then plot it. So here is a plot of the histogram, where you can see how many pixels you have in the dark values, so this corresponds, for, for example, to the coat of the cameraman, and that you have a broader peak for lighter values, and uh, corresponding for the mostly to, to the background. And uh, so we have already seen how to um, uh, plot contours corresponding to uh, different values. And when you plot different contours, here you see that we can have different contours, and you see that in, in this region here, where the histogram is very flat and doesn't have many pixels, then um, the, the contour don't change much. So um, I have an exercise here to plot the histogram of uh, three RGB channels for an image, but uh, I will leave it for people who are really fast and uh, go directly to image binarization because, um, yeah, because we have an exercise at the end, so we'll still have an exercise in this notebook. So wh when I have my array camera, I can choose a threshold to binarize it by hand, but First, it requires me to plot the histogram and then to decide, okay, 
here it might be good to threshold the image because uh, there is a clear separation between black pixels and uh, bright pixels. Uh, but it, re it requires some work, and if I have a large number of images, like a time series, for example, uh, I want an automatic decision to be taken, or if I don't want any user, like uh, I'm driving my automatic car, it, it, it needs to decide by itself whether to brake or not. I don't want to look at the histogram of pixels. So uh, <laughs> for this, I will use, we will use automatic thresholding functions uh, that you can find in the filters submodule of scikit-image. So you have this uh, filters that threshold O2 uh, function because O2 is the most common thresholding algorithm. And in fact, what, what it does is it tries to cluster the histograms in two populations that are really well separated. It tries to find the best separation in uh, statistical terms to uh, have two populations of pixels. And so let's, let's look at uh, the, the output. So you can see that it uh, produced a, a segmentation automatically. So the function returns the value, the best value of the threshold, and then you can create a mask using this, this value. And um, what is nice is also that you have a, a lot of different thresholding algorithms in scikit-image, and you have a utility function called try all thresholds, which compares all the different threshold algorithms for one image. So you can choose um, the one that suits you the best. For example, here, uh, this, this triangle looks nice because it doesn't have much of the background or you can just pick one uh, from uh, this uh, mosaic of uh, examples. Okay. Um, so I insist that here it's completely automatic thresholding. You don't need any user uh, input value. And uh, I have here an exercise with uh, more advanced thresholding, where instead of having just one global threshold for the image, uh, you can have a threshold that varies spatially, because, for example, in this data.coins image, you can see that the background here is quite dark, but uh, on, the, on the border here it's lighter. So it's, it's quite difficult to find a global threshold for the whole image. So what I ask you to do is to uh, compare global thresholding, so applying O2 filter, so this function, to the coins image, and then uh, to take a look at the threshold local function that allows you to do local thresholding and to, to compare the result of the two. Does that make sense? Or yeah. A, a quick survey. Um, who, who thinks this tutorial is going uh, too fast? So who thinks it's going too slowly? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you, you, you can't be all happy. So you think it's going a bit slowly? Okay. So who? A little bit too fast, a little bit too slow. So you, you must have an opinion. It can't be perfect. I, I, I'm French. I never think something is perfect. I, I always complain. <laughs> okay, but if you don't say your opinions, then I, I will assume that it's perfect. It, it's good for my self-esteem. So. <laughs> <laughs>
Shall I give the solution? Who 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 finished? Yeah. So for global thresholding. Um it's filters threshold Otsu of coins and then im show coins and I will just plot the, the contour of coins greater than value. So what what you see is that it so yeah l l let me maybe just show the mask so w when I, I apply a global threshold uh, I have several defects like the the lighter part of the background is counted as a uh, foreground as object and also I have some holes uh in in the coins so it's uh, it's far from perfect there are several ways of visualizing this either displaying the the mask or using contours and so let's turn to global thresholding so I don't know the syntax of local thresholding so threshold local so let's just display the help uh, so you need to pass an image a block size and then it returns an array of thresholds okay so block size uh, coins and then it needs a, a a nod number which is a bit silly but uh, this should be corrected uh, no, th there are plenty of bugs in the, in the package, and the, the more the, the good thing is uh, the more you use it, uh, the, the more you see the bugs. So it's very important that developers are, are users as well. <laughs> and okay, so what do we see? We see that maybe we have less. Less background included. It's more on, on the border. And we can also try to play like... Uh, yeah, ma maybe this was better. Th there are functions in Image actually to remove pixels touching a border. So this this image would be easier for post-processing than this one where uh, this, uh, this part here almost touches one of the coins. So when global thresholding doesn't work well, turning to local thresholding ca can be a good idea. Okay, so thresholding is uh, quite important in image processing because uh, for image segmentation, uh, you often want to end up with a binary value, bi binary image, but with a histogram you can do other things like modifying the distribution of intensity values. And um, here I show you the results of applying this equalized ist function, which uh, stretches the contrast of an image, like in this camera image that I have here. You see that here in the coat uh, there are not so many details because the, 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 the black pixels they are all compressed together and so wh what equalized ist does is that it, uh, it stretches together the, the part of the histogram that were too compressed so that it has a, a uniform cumulative distribution function. This is this, uh, this red plot. But so you will use these functions mostly for uh, visualization, not so much for processing, 
because uh, unless you want to equalize the contrast between different images that were taken with different exposure, that can be a first pre-processing step. But you, you didn't create any information by uh, changing the distribution, the, the histogram. Actually, you, you, you lost some uh, information due to rounding errors and so on. So uh, be, be careful with this. Um, so in, in this, in this uh, notebook, I have a last part with uh, color images. So how to um, extend what we have seen for grayscale images to color images, because it's not possible to threshold one color image, because you have uh, the, the, the three channels. And for example, here on this image of a beach, uh, you, you don't have one threshold that would apply for all the color channels. So you, you have several options. One of them is to turn to the LAB color space that we saw uh, in the previous uh, notebook. And then the first, so the, the, the red one, corresponds to light intensity. And then I, I can uh, threshold according to light intensity, or I can use one of the color channels like, for example, here, I, I used the, the, the last color channel because it uh, will make a, a good difference between blue and, and uh, I don't remember whether it's red or... Uh, but you have two color axes, and since the color of the sky and the sea is quite different from the color of the bushes, then uh, you see that uh, the resulting segmentation is, uh, is quite good. So, <clears throat> so I, I know I'm going really uh, fast through this, so uh, you will have the, the, the time to uh, look at this at home. And uh, so here I used only the light intensity information switching to this LAB color space. But if you want to use all the channels, because you have information in all the channels, you can also use clustering methods. And uh, for this, I, I put a link here to the SciPy US tutorial uh, that I gave one, one month ago. And uh, where was that? Oh, I have no internet. OK, but <laughs> if you follow the link, you will have it. And uh, you will see both how to use several channels and also how to uh, separate an image into more than just two regions, foreground and background, but having more, um, uh, more labels. OK, so uh, we have 15 minutes left for our last tutorial, which is how to do more complex things, uh, image filtering and segmentation. Because here with thresholding or uh, exposure modification, what we have done is w we have taken each pixel and we have looked at its value. And it's all that we have done. We have not considered its neighbors. Um, however, usually when you have a natural image, uh, neighboring pixels tend to belong to the same object. They tend to have similar gray values. And this is the kind of information that we can use for image processing. And in this tutorial, we will see how to filter images and how to segment an object, that is, how to attribute labels to pixels corresponding to different objects like these coins in the, in the coin image, and how to do some measures on these images. Um, so the, the two cells are just uh, internal machinery. This, this is a function to plot uh, images together, so don't worry about this. And let's go directly to the image filtering part. So wh what is a, a linear filter? It's a convolution between, so convolution, it's a mathematical term, but don't worry about this. It's just mixing together uh, pixels uh, between an image and a local kernel, where um, you will mix together pixel values in the neighborhood of the central pixel. So for example, here, if I take this 3 by 3 uniform kernel, uh, I remember that somebody mentioned, the, you, you mentioned a uniform filter, uh, then what I will do is that I will replace a central pixel by the average of pixels in the neighborhood. So I can do this, for example, for smoothing out some noise. Um, 
I can choose a red, a red, sorry, a square <laughs> kernel, but I can also choose a different geometry. Like for example, let's take, let's say I want to uh, take the closest neighbors, but not the diagonal pixel. So then I will have a diamond shaped kernel. And uh, I can have different weights on the kernel, like not uniform weights, but Gaussian weights. And I can also have a nonlinear filter, which is that I will not use a linear combination of pixels around my central pixel, but I will ask for the median value, for example. So let's take some examples using, uh, once again, this coins image, but uh, a zoom on one of the coins. You can see that uh, this uh, little picture is a bit noisy. In these regions, you would expect to have more uniform gray values. So uh, we can use several denoising filters. The first one is a Gaussian filter. And you see that uh, it smooths out really well the noise, but also it smooths out the edges. And it's completely normal because it's a smoothing filter. So it does what it's supposed to do. And um, when you use the median filter, uh, this time the edges are really better preserved. So when you're doing some denoising, the um, never use a Gaussian filter, in fact. A, a median filter has the advantage of uh, preserving edges, but also to uh, be very fast. You have other denoising filters in, uh, in scikit-image. If, uh, if you want to use them, they can be found in the restoration submodule. Import restoration. And if you want to explore into restoration, you have denoise TV for total variation. You have denoise non-local means and, and so on. So you can just try them and look for examples in the gallery. Um, so how many exercises do I have here? Yeah, so we, we will not do the exercise about the Gaussian weights. Uh, it, it's, or oh, you can do it if you feel like doing it instead of uh, um, li listening to me, it's, it's fine as well. Um, what I suggest here is to uh, print the weight, to visualize the weights of a Gaussian kernel by applying the Gaussian filter to a very simple image, which is a, a, a delta function in uh, mathematical terms, where you have uh, an image that is completely zero with a central uh, white, so one valued pixel. And then when you apply the Gaussian filter to it, uh, you can have the, the weights of the Gaussian kernel. But um, let, 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 let's move on so that we have the time to do the rest of the tutorial. And there will be one last exercise. So uh, we have seen some simple filters like Gaussian filters, median filters. And there is another class of filters, which is called mathematical morphology. So mathematical morphology is how to modify shapes in an image. Uh, and it's very simple operations, but which are uh, quite efficiently implemented. So it's very fast. So it has the advantage of uh, uh, executing really fast on larger ways. And um, what we will see first is how to do an erosion and a dilation. So let's create a simple image here, which is a binary image with a central uh, bright square on a dark background. And by an erosion, you replace a pixel by the minimum value of pixels in a neighborhood around these pixels. So for this neighborhood, you need what's called a structuring element. So these structuring elements are small arrays, like a square array or a diamond array. And um, the central value, it represents the pixel, the central pixel being considered. And the surrounding values, it's the neighbors. If you have a one, it means that uh, this pixel will be a neighbor. And if it's zero, it does not. So le let's show what an erosion does. An erosion, it replaces the value of a pixel by the minimum value of pixels covered by the central, st by, by the structuring element. So here I use a diamond cross, a structuring element, 
And when I drew an erosion, you can see that I removed all the border pixels. Why? Because when I covered one pixel with a structuring element, it covered some zero. And therefore, it turned the central value to zero. So that's an erosion. It has a consequence of removing border pixels. And the reverse operation, it's called a dilation. So it does a reverse. It replaces a pixel by the maximum value of pixels in the neighborhood. And uh, so it has a consequence of um, adding a layer of pixels uh, on the border of uh, of, um, of a shape. So um, when you do an erosion with a large structuring element, you can remove some objects because, for example, here I use a square of size 5. And then when I erode it, uh, there is nothing left. Because even for the central pixel, when I covered it was a structuring element. There, there were some zeros in the neighborhood, and therefore, uh, I made my object disappear. Th therefore, uh, mathematical morphology can be really useful to close uh, some small holes or uh, to remove some small objects that are noise that you that you don't want. And uh, this is wha what is done in the exercise here. Um, So in the exercise here, I create an image that is uh, that is binary, but that has some noise. And I want to retrieve my initial objects that were bigger and, and smoother. And for this, I will use uh, two mathematical morphology functions, uh, closing and opening which are found in the scikit image, uh, dot morphology. Um, so we have five minutes left in the tutorial. So uh, we have two, two possibilities, either doing the exercise together or finishing the lecture with uh, some image segmentation strategies. So uh, who, who wants to do the exercise? Yes. Who, who, who wants to see image segmentation? Okay, so, so more, more people. So wh what I propose is that people who want to do the exercise, you do the exercise. And no, no, no. And uh, I cover the segmentation. And at the, at the end, when it's time for the coffee break, but I will take two minutes just to correct uh, so that there will be something for, for everybody. But so people who want to do the exercise don't listen to what I, I say about segmentation now. Close your ears. Um, so image segmentation, it consists in attributing labels to pixels, uh, like object and background. And we have already seen some segmentation using thresholding, either simple thresholding or uh, local thresholding, thresholding followed with some post-processing or uh, preceded by uh, pre-processing, like using a filter, a median filter before thresholding can be useful. But uh, in scikit image, you can also use more advanced uh, algorithm, which require less uh, hand tuning. That is, I have an image, and boom, I want it to be segmented in some objects. And um, you have several approaches for this. Here, I cover two approaches, and I think uh, I will describe only the first one here uh, in this room, which is a marker-based segmentation. So marker-based, it uses some pixels of which we are sure, completely sure, they belong either to background or foreground, or they belong to a given class of uh, pixels. So you remember this uh, coins object? So when we plotted, so here this big contour, the best O2 threshold, it, um, it, it, it was not a good value because it mixed together pixels from the background, from the foreground. However, uh, we have pixels in the, in the histogram where, um, let me just show again the histogram.
we were really sure about about this. Uh, so this is a histogram, and so these pixels, which are really dark, they should correspond to uh, the background, and the pixels, which are really bright, they should correspond to the coins. Just that you see on the histogram, you have no clear separation. That's, that's why Otsu thresholding was not really good. So let's let's um, take some values like 30. 30, it's a blue contour here. It should definitely uh, belong to the background and value smaller than 30, and value larger than 150, so it's inside this yellow contour, they should belong to the coins. We still have all these values in between. We are not sure of, uh, of them. Like, um, but, we will be able to, so these values, they will be not known. The, the segmentation algorithm has to determine them. But we will use these values, bright ones, and these values, the black, the black ones, as uh, uh, markers. And we will use marked pixel to propagate the labels through the neighbors until all pixels are determined. So for this, we use an algorithm that's called the watershed uh, algorithm. And uh, it uses an, an array uh, of edges, so which so I will just display it. It's easier. So you ha you have the array of markers here with uh, known pixels of the background here in beige, known pixels of the foreground in white. And the array of edges, it tells the propagation algorithm uh, how to propagate the label. If you have a strong edge, you should not be able to go through this edge because you want to stay inside regions that have similar uh, gray values. So you cannot cross strong gradients. That's why you need an edge uh, um, array. And for this, you use the Sobol filter. And then you call this watershed segmentation algorithm from the segmentation module, and uh, you create uh, an array that is binary, so for foreground and background. Uh, so this does automatic segmentation. As long as you provide the markers, uh, then it does an automatic segmentation of the image of edges. And yeah, one thing that is very important is uh, once that you have a binary image, you want to label the different connected components. You want to have a different numbers, number for each of these coins. And for this, you have one very convenient function of scikit-image, which, which is called label. It takes a binary image, or just a zero and one, and it attributes a different label to uh, every object that is disconnected from the rest. So. Uh, I've seen that some people re-implement this kind of methods, but it's just one function. And uh, please use the label function. And after, when you have a labeled array, you can, um, you can measure the properties of labeled objects using the measure.regionprops function. And so I'm not explaining it here, but you can ask for areas, mean intensities, perimeters, and so on. So all this is already coded in scikit-image. Okay, um, so I, I know I went really fast at the end, but I hope I started uh, slowly enough so that there was something for everybody. So uh, this is the end of the tutorial. I, I'm not forgetting that I should correct uh, the exercise, but <laughs> just want to wrap up. Uh, if you want to do more, you have actually a lot of uh, psychic image tutorials uh, on the scikit image uh, GitHub repository. So you can have more of them if you want to, to go through them. Um, spend time on the gallery of uh, scikit image. Uh, ask questions either on GitHub or on the mailing list. And we also have a paper that you can cite if uh, you find it useful. So it's uh, always nice to acknowledge the paper uh, for, for the authors. 
So thanks a lot. You, you've been a, a great crowd, and uh, it was nice to interact with you. Uh, I will stay here during the first half of the coffee break, so first to correct the exercise and uh, also to answer your questions. You, you have a question? No. Uh, if, uh, if you wish. And of course, if you want to talk more about image processing, uh, I'm happy to talk about it. I'm here until Friday. On Friday, we will have a, a sprint on Psychic Image. Uh, so if you're interested in contributing to the package, you're more than welcome to, to, to come. Uh, thanks a lot and enjoy the coffee, N not only the coffee uh, images that we had. Uh, oh, we, we didn't use the coffee image. We only had uh, the cat image. Sorry about that. <laughs> so let's enjoy some coffee. Thank you. <laughs> Let me let me correct the mathematical morphology. Yeah. It was here, so I had this noisy image and. Morphology <laughs> dot binary opening noisy im <laughs> so opening removes the small white dots. What an opening does it's uh, first an erosion and then a dilation. Having the two allows you not to modify too much because if you just did an erosion, you would remove the small white dots, but then you would also have sh shrunk all the, the shapes. So you make them grow again by doing the dilation. It's just that the small objects have gone. And then, thank you. And then closing. By now we're closing of opening. So you, you see this pipeline mode? You just apply a filter on the filter that you had before, on the output that you had. And this is it. So it's, it's, not, it's not perfect, but it's really less noisy than the, the first one.